Leon Battista Alberti, 15th century author, artist, architect, poet, priest, linguist, philosopher, and cryptographer said, a man can do all things if he will. And thus we have the birth of the polymath or Renaissance man. And while we could look to someone like Leonardo da Vinci as an example of the right way to be a Renaissance man, he never wrote an actual how-to manual on the topic. But you know who did? Baldessare Castiglione. So we are going to talk about his book of the courtier and see how we measure up. Welcome to Remember, Remember, a podcast about histories, mysteries, and did you know that Renaissance is the French word meaning rebirth. I always kind of thought it was an Italian word because I associate the Renaissance period most closely with Italy, though, of course, the Renaissance happened all over Europe, but it is not Italian, it's French. And you know who probably already knew that it was a French word? My co-host, Matthew. Say something in French, Matthew. Matthew. Bonjour. Because <laughs> you studied French in school, right? Yeah, of course I did. Because like here in America, I think most of us take Spanish. Like that's the language you learn in elementary school. Uh, but you, I feel like y'all do French. But like every English speaking Canadian I've ever met, I don't speak that much French. One of the things that's going to be fun today is how differently we say the main word that's going to be repeated over and over again in this episode. Because I say Renaissance. Renaissance. Yeah, and you say Renaissance because of accent. Well, how do the French say it? Good question. While you're looking that up, I was also thinking after I wrote the thing about being like, oh, wait, this isn't an Italian word. Well, of course not, because this wasn't really referred to as the Renaissance period until after it happened, right? This is something that people later applied to this period. So it's not like the Italians themselves were like, we should use a French word to describe what we're doing right now. Like, that's not how it happened anyway. In French, it's kind of more like Renaissance. (laughs) Renaissance. So it's kind of in between Renaissance and Renaissance, but it's almost closer to the way the Americans say it. Well, there you go. Today, we are talking about what a Renaissance man is and how we specifically can be a good one. When I think of Renaissance man, I think of a man with four arms, four legs, standing in a circle, splayed open. Ah, the Vitruvian man. Just the Vitruvian man. That's not necessarily a Renaissance man. No, but that was done, right, by Leonardo da Vinci, who is seen as like one of the highest examples of what a Renaissance man is. I think a bit of a show off, if I'm honest. What does Renaissance man even mean? It's just jack of all trades, isn't it really? I literally have that written in my script. Yes, we are going to talk about it. Even though it seems like being a Renaissance man means you're a show off, a huge key of being a true renaissance man it's not showing off it is showing off though because before them you've got dirk he works in the field i just plow the field then go to bed that's all he does all day wakes up kisses his ugly wife (laughs) who wants to say she's ugly just because she married a man named dirk they're all ugly if they're peasants paula have you not heard oh yes yes of course you are speaking like a true renaissance man now thank you You know, he kisses his wife (laughs) and his beautiful children and he goes and plows a field and he does that all day and then he goes back home and that's it. And a renaissance man is, oh, I don't just plow the field like a pauper. I do think about this and I think about that and I think about who this because I've got the money and the power to do that and not have to worry about this. I get to think I resent the renaissance men. Screw them. Anyone who's a, re- a, a renaissance man, a renaissance man, was probably never plowing a field. Let's be real. That's what I mean. They're privileged, right? To be, You've got to be privileged yes. to be a renaissance man. You've got yes. to have the financial freedom to follow your heart and do... It's like... You ever read the picture Dorian Gray? Yes. And there's that whole chapter that you can just skip about all the things he's learned. <laughs> It just goes on and on and on. And you just think, gosh, yeah, I get it. That's what he is. He's just a renaissance man. I could do whatever I want. Just like in Groundhog Day. Me and my ilk, 
We have to still... I'm with Dirk plowing the... I work for Dirk. I'm not even Dirk. Wow, rough life. I'm sleeping with Dirk's wife. <laughs> That's how you know that she's ugly. Because you've been into, not because she's, hold on. This sounded like I was like, and that's how we know she's ugly because Matthew's sleeping with her and that's the only person who would sleep with Matthew, an ugly person. That's not what I'm saying, even though I said it and then it sounded like that's what I was saying. I was saying that's how you know intimately what her level of attractiveness is. Oh, holes being dug. Let's define Renaissance man. (laughs) Feels like you're saying it. (laughs) Let's define Renaissance man or the universal man which is another term for it, and probably more of what they called it during the Renaissance. The bicentennial man? (laughs) Different thing. Basically, if you've attended a liberal arts college or university, you've had an education structured after the many principles of the Renaissance. And though this is a very European source of ideas, I actually learned while writing the script that the liberal arts structure of education is a very American thing. Makes me feel worse, liberals. It's, it's not that kind of... Pick a side, liberals. <laughs> they have picked a side, I think. Pick the other side, liberals. <laughs> it's not that kind of liberal. Be like me. I'm an, I'm an enlightened centrist. Everyone hates me. <laughs> That's literally no side picked, I feel. No, it's picking sides based on the quality of the argument presented on a given topic. That's what being an enlightened centrist is all about. But it does enrage everyone. In a very modern sense, being a Renaissance man boils down to being well-rounded or, like Matthew said before, a jack-of-all-trades. You know about a lot of different subjects and you're skilled in a lot of different areas. And this all springs from the intellectual movement called Renaissance Humanism. It's often specified in that way, specifically Renaissance humanism, because modern humanism movements have morphed and evolved from the initial ideas that started blooming during the Renaissance. And those ideas were, hey, let's focus less on the study of religion and more on the study of what it means to be human. What is our individual experience? Let's study classical works and find artifacts of antiquity and use them to connect to our humanity. They didn't necessarily want to contradict religion. They just wanted to prioritize the study of humanity in order to create better citizens. I feel like humanism now really does stand opposed to theism. Yes, yeah. Humanism now, and that's why it felt important to specify Renaissance humanism, because then it really wasn't meant to contradict religion. But now it humanism is much more about like rational thought and kind of eschewing religion from your worldview in a very loose way. If you're a humanist out there and you feel like I haven't done you justice, just let me know. Some of these humanist values included the study of Latin and the love of words, which is philology, literature, broader access to education, public and private virtue, the moral autonomy of the individual, creativity, critical analysis, and the idea that artists and the arts can be a guide toward a better way of living. The principles of the Renaissance. These are all the things and high ideals I believed when I was a teenager, I feel like, could have kind of grown out of. (laughs) I think the world has just beaten you down. You're like, art, yeah, wouldn't that be nice? (laughs) It's like, have any of these people experienced the real world? Is that something that they're familiar with? Where (laughs) you got to just suck it up and do something terrible until you die? That's kind of like what life's like, really. (laughs) (laughs) Well, their idea was that we could move humanity beyond that, which is like the ideal that they're trying to enact, I guess, here. So this brings us to Baldessare Castiglione. I'm doing my best with the pronunciation, so bear with me. If you know a better way to say his name, uh, let me know. I think it's finally time for you to admit that you're not as Italian as you tell people. I'm Italian. I just don't know stuff. Look, just because I got Italian in my blood doesn't mean I got Italian in my mouth. Stop now, Paula. That's too much. Yeah, I had regrets as soon as I was saying it. Castiglione was an author, soldier, diplomat, and courtier of the late 1400s, early 1500s. And he did a lot of things. But the one we are talking about today is The Book of the Courtier, which he wrote a first draft of in about 1508. And then he spent 20 years or so revising it, finally publishing it in 1528. 
The book is framed as a dialogue among members of the Court of Urbino. Castiglione was a member of this court, but he set his book during a time when he was away, so he's not a character in his own book, though all the other characters are real courtiers who he knew. Many of them actually died before he finally got the Book of the Courtier published. And part of me is like, I wonder if he waited One of the reasons it took so long to publish the book was he didn't want to publish it while these like fictionalized versions of real people were still alive or if it's just like coincidence. I don't know. You've always got to be careful when doing a Roman Eclef, right? You have to be careful because Thomas Wolfe wrote Look Homeward Angel, you know, and that was all about just life growing up in Asheville. And he's just like, did he name real people with their real names? No, but it was very clear who everyone was. These were people with their real names. <laughs> Look Home with Angel, which is one of the best books ever written, was phenomenally popular. And I tell you what, he did not go back to Asheville for a long time. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, this is me? Oh, that's what you think about me? He was really airing out the dirty laundry. <laughs> Asheville, North Carolina was not a big town at the turn of the century. <laughs> it is, <laughs> yeah, it's not a big town. It's still not really a big town. So... This book is basically a fictionalized dialogue of all these real courtiers sitting around and talking about and debating what makes the perfect courtier. And I'm not convinced Castiglione actually meant it as a how-to guy, but more like a philosophical examination of ideas. But however he meant it, all of Europe seemed to take it like their version of how to win friends and influence people or... I don't know, something else from the self-help section. It was like their chicken soup for the soul. But he did write it with the intention of getting it published. Yes. He didn't write... It's not like Marcus Aurelius' Meditations, which was written just for Marcus Aurelius to... It was his diary, essentially, that got released hundreds of years after his death. He he got it published. So it was somewhere in between a how-to and a meditation on the concept of being a courtesan. I don't know if he was like meditating on it for himself. I don't think he was using it to explore the ideas for himself. I think he was trying to inspire other people to explore those ideas. Does that make sense? I'm against him. I've gone I've taken against him honestly. I don't know why. Really? Telling me what to do. <laughs> I'm working class. I haven't got time to, to learn Italian. Well, that's okay. He didn't write this book for you. He wrote it for the people of the court. He wrote it for nobles. It wasn't for you. What an arsehole. According to Peter Burke, a historian and professor at Cambridge, by the end of the 1500s, the Book of the Courtier had more than 100 editions, and by 1565 had been translated to Spanish, French, English, Latin, and German. So all the dead Romans could read it. That's right. That's right. You really want... It's important for them to know how to behave in the afterlife, you know? Because he wrote it in the common vernacular. This was a big thing for him. It was like, speak the way people actually talk so they can understand what you're saying. There are stories of Charles V keeping three books by his bed, one of those books being the Book of the Courtier. It's apocryphal, but it could be true. It sounds a bit like Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power. It's banned in, or it was, I know it was banned in lots of prisons. Really? Because some people read it. It's one of them, it's it's kind of, people call it one of the most dangerous books ever written. Huh. And it's written in this same court type setting court it like mm. you know in the in the in the presence of the king be like this uh, in, Interesting. In behind people's doors don't it's very i imagine robert green probably modeled some of what he did on that because uh, the 48 laws of power it's a fantastic book and people are people think it's dangerous because if you were to follow all these rules you could become quite a deceptive person in many ways a manipulative person sounds a bit like machiavelli well it's very much machiavelli but what 48 laws of power is doing is teaching you to see these things in others interesting to protect yourself from interesting or at least that's what he says huh. so everyone who reads it gets real paranoid yeah i mean <laughs> it's a good book i'll be honest <laughs> <laughs> Members of the court all over Europe were using the Book of the Courtier to guide their appearance and their behavior. So this was hugely influential. So I think it's time to find out how we measure up to Castiglione's ideal courtier renaissance man. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about a lot of the things that the book says you need to be the perfect courtier. And uh, hey, listeners, let us know how you measure up. I'd love to know. 
we should next after this, we should do one of those things, which is like, this is how to be a good wife in 1850. <laughs> <laughs> and see if you measure off. Oh, we'll have a woman specific uh, bit of this list too. Okay. <laughs> I'm certain I do not measure up to how to be a good wife in 1850. But okay, first thing, be born noble. How are we doing on that? Well, I was born, so that's half of that done. First off, straight away, you were half yes. a tick. We've been born, but half a tick is also half a cross. Let's no. be honest about it. <laughs> My parents were and are working class. Now, I also am working class, so I think I fail this one, which means probably. So it's going to be harder. But of course, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Oh yeah, totally, totally American nobility right here. Solid, solid American lower middle class kind of birth. I wonder how this book reflects on people who come into wealth, then come into power, and the people who are military children, for instance. Their father goes off and does a great battle and wins a big war or is distinguished in some way. I'm wondering how this reflects on people who become noble as it were well so again this book is written like a dialogue so the different characters who are again modeled after modeled and named after real people are having a conversation hey to be a good courtier you have to be born noble and the other people are like well do you though because some people have all these virtues you know some nobles are shitheads and some common born people you know come into nobility and so they have like a debate about it but they settle on well first impressions are important and it's much easier to get respect immediately from everyone at court if you were born noble so to be a perfect courtier you need that this is very much this kind of has a ancient greek feel to it a lot of those books would be like this is how aristotle would have spoken to plato and this is the I'm telling my story, but I'm telling it through these other voices. You have exactly hit the nail on the head. Uh, Castiglione modeled quite a bit of this after the works of Aristotle and Plato. Okay, so... It's funny because they do this in China as well, and they would do books which were Confucius talking to someone. And in a way, it kind of gives the words more power. It's kind of like a, it's a bit of a sinister trick to pull sometimes. So we both kind of fail on the be born noble, but that's okay because maybe we can prove ourselves in other ways. Okay. Possess natural grace. I'm going to argue this. Yes. Neither of us are particularly naturally graceful. Okay. Okay. What? Just because I'm covered in bruises from running into furniture all the time. Is that? I do think that I at least win this round between us two. You are one of the clumsiest people I've ever met. <laughs> Pretty clumsy, it's true. All right, next. Must make good first impressions. I think I make a great first impression. Parents like me, I've always found. They do. My parents, my mom loves you. I think we do okay on make good first impressions. I'm gonna, well, I think we tick on this one. I think so. I think we check that one off. The first one, I think that we properly check off. Okay, next. Be attractive in face and body. Be just the right size, not too big, not too small. Look, I know this is a, an audio format. People don't necessarily know what we look like. So I'm going to say... Check. Definitely check. Check, check, <laughs> and check. We are wildly attractive. Not too big, not too small. Done. Good looking people right here. This is so unfair. A lot of emphasis placed on outward appearances here, at least to start. Because, again, it's very important to them making that good first impression. Yeah, but you can't help if you look like you've been hit with a boot. You can't help, but it might make it harder for people to like you. All right, how about this? Be modest and avoid boasting. You can mention your accomplishments, and you should, but not in a way that draws, like, attention to them. I think that's great. I Did I tell you I have a podcast? Oh, my goodness. Do you? You have a podcast. I, I have multiple podcasts, oh, too, really? in fact. Oh, yeah. wow. Pretty good, pretty good. Oh, okay. Yeah, they were right. There you go. You've mentioned your accomplishments, drawing some attention to them, but you're being modest about them. They're all right. They're okay. I like this one, though. I, let's not talk money. That's, this is Britain, right? Don't tell me how much you earn because <laughs> we're all going to feel bad about it. Okay, next. I think you've got this one down, Matthew. Wear plain, distinguished clothes like the Spaniards. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but another place it was, uh, it, was, it was labeled as dark and somber. 
And you're like the Spaniards. You're in all black right now. So I think you count as dark and somber. I don't think my clothes are plain enough. You have a unicorn hoodie that you wear sometimes. It's a narwhal. Excuse me. It's a narwhal. Yeah, well. Okay, next. Courage on the battlefield. Plain clothes like the Spaniards? I don't know why. I even tried to look up, like, what were the Spaniards wearing in the 1500s? I like, <laughs> I think the definition of plain was a little different. <laughs> Moseying on over to South America dressed in bright red clothes <laughs> like the Spaniards. <laughs> Are you just avoiding talking about courage on the battlefield? I'm just thinking of a conquistador in a bright red pantaloons and thinking, that's not particularly plain. That's all. <laughs> Skilled in armed combat, specifically weapon handling. What kind of weapons can you handle there, Matthew? I live in the United Kingdom, so we don't really have weapons other than my razor wit. Now, I think if we call that a weapon then I wield it like no other. There you go. Which doesn't necessarily mean good. <laughs> it just means unique. You can take that home, by the way. If you say to someone, I do it like no one else, that can mean good that or bad. That can mean bad. anything. That's actually a pretty good way of referring to yourself. Actually, that feels very Renaissance, man. You've talked about your accomplishment without drawing attention to whether it's good or bad. I've learned to not draw attention to whether something's good or bad because I've worked on a lot of things that haven't worked out. Okay, so to recap, courage on the battlefield, skilled in armed combat, but next, conflict resolution. Let's not get into that now, Paula, because we had an argument before we started this show. We did, but we resolved it through our skill in armed combat. It struck me as very funny that it's like, be a courageous soldier, be really good at fighting, but also, could you like de-escalate the situation though? Let's calm things down. Let's stop this craziness of this siege and, you know, just come out. We'll talk. I have this mace raised above my head, but let's use some I feeling statements. I feel ready to smash your brains <laughs> in. How do you feel? I'm just thinking about all these Renaissance men who went to the Aztec Empire and how they didn't really talk anyone down. I think they are talking about when dealing with other Renaissance men. <laughs> yes, I think so. A lot of this is like, do this in front of other nobles. Let's stop this silliness and really work out a plan to get everyone else, you know? Horsemanship. That's, that's the next thing that you need to be good at. Can you ride horses? I'll say I have once done one of those things where you get on a horse and it gets like led through a trail. And it scared me. So that's where I'm at with horsemanship. How about you, Matthew? I've never ridden a horse in my life, but I do live near a horse field. Have you fed a horse a carrot? Well, I often have to walk through the horse field when I'm walking my dog. My dog thinks the horse is a very big dog. <laughs> but I have fed horses apples and carrots and grass and sometimes polo mints because they love them. You in America might call them lifesavers. You feed a lifesaver to a horse? Yeah, that's something that we do in the UK. We feed horses mint. Huh. Interesting. <laughs> I actually don't know how good or bad that is for horses. I imagine you shouldn't do it. Well, I know you could give them like a lump of sugar, I feel like. So maybe that's a thing. Horses love a pop. They love playing polo and they love polo mint. We've got hunting. We've got be good at sports like wrestling and tennis, but no acrobatics. Is that a bit too feminine? I think it, it is funny to me that there are some things that are like, do this, but don't be too effeminate. I'm like, y'all, by today's standards, are pretty damn effeminate. So it's very interesting to me the way how we view gender expression is all based on societal context, right? I don't think it's all based on societal context, but I can see that some of it is based on societal context. They're big fans of the Greeks and the Romans, and they don't want you to be too effeminate. That's a contradiction right there. Oh, also be good at what they call passive games. And I'm going to say we check that box like a million times because I'm pretty sure that means like card games, board games. I think we're so good at passive games, mind games. Oh, mind games. Yeah, passive aggressive games. We're so good at that. The tick goes into another box and ticks it. So that gets us two things that we were. That gets us tennis as well, I think. I wonder where coits comes in all this. There's no listing of coits, but sure, that could probably fit in with sports. Were they cornholing, do you reckon? No, I don't think they were. But who knows? Maybe they were. Maybe they were. They were doing some type of horseshoes. 
And I'm great at that. Okay, be a good dancer, but don't show off. This isn't Soul Train. Just do the moves well, but don't make them too unique. I'm not able to tick this one. I think we both fail this one a little bit. Well, I am not a good dancer, but you are at least an energetic dancer. (laughs) Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Avoid affectation or artificial mannerisms. This this leads into the idea of, oh no, I'm not sure I'm saying this right, sprezzatura. And these are Italians doing this? Yeah. Uh, it's be nonchalant. Put your hands in your pockets when you're talking then, lads, because this, you're, <laughs> you're going to be using them too much. Never show the effort of the work that you did, Matthew. It should always look easy, natural, graceful. If you can see the work behind it, no one will respect it. I just disagree with that, straight up. I think don't complain is a good idea. Well, they're not, I was, I'm thinking in working class terms, like pretend that this bale of hay isn't heavy. They're not touching bales of hay. They mean ordering other men to do things. <laughs> they mean like you created this speech and you said it in front of a bunch of people, but it looked very off the cuff. Oh. That's, you know, like you painted this, but don't let anyone see the effort it took you to paint it really well. It should be like, oh yeah, I just did that. Oh, Michelangelo screwed that. He wasn't a Renaissance man. He did nothing but complain about the Sistine Chapel. <laughs> Oh, my back. Oh. Be able to write poetry and prose. Be able to play multiple instruments. All right, name name the instruments you can play. I mean, to, um, this one I've got. I can play the guitar, I can play the bass, and I can play the drums. I can play the trumpet. I can sort of play the ukulele. I can play a little bit of the piano. Oh, I can play the ukulele. I've got a kazoo. Kazoo doesn't count, Paula. We all know that. Kazoo counts. Do you say kazoo or kazoo? I, I say kazoo. Not every time. Not every time you don't say kazoo. Sometimes you say kazoo. No. Listen back to that. I did say it weird. I did say it weird uh, just then. Be good at drawing and painting. No, not. I'm not good at that. And Bob Ross is like, anyone can do this. Bob, I've I've watched every episode of your show. Respect you hugely. I can't do it. (laughs) Avoid flattery, which you've just done. But give lots of compliments, which you haven't done. I'm really good at compliments. Oh, okay. Well, you're definitely good at complimenting yourself. (laughs) Remember the thing about not drawing? Well, mention your accomplishments, but don't draw attention to them. Hmm. How do you do that? Oh, by the way, Paula, your hair today, others wouldn't do it, but you have managed to do it. Thank you for avoiding flattery just then. It's really brave Mm -hmm. that you're wearing your hair like that. Right, 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 right. Thank you so much. And I respect that you didn't dress up for this podcast recording. That is true. I did not. Have close friendships. With virtuous men. Virtuous men, Matthew. I don't think I... I don't want to put a judgment call on anyone who would call me a friend, but... Yeah, all your friends who are listening right now are like, excuse me. Any real friend is not listening, let's be honest. No. They're like, "Uh, yeah, I hear them talk about this stuff all the time. I don't need to listen to his podcast. I already can't stand him. No, many languages. I know of them. Here's the thing you're good at. Always take the opportunity to demonstrate talents and avoid having to show things you don't know. If someone asks you to do something that you don't know about, you should just go, no, I don't think I will do that. Thank you, though. Because you would hate to embarrass yourself. I think this is in the line of stay one step ahead of the people you're teaching. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, the next thing is don't compete with ordinary people unless you're sure of winning. I hate these people. Because, again, you would hate to debase yourself. I just, you know what? I feel like we use the phrase, and I know this is just one man's idea of being a renaissance man but this is also was a highly influential idea of the core belief of what a renaissance man should be became the archetypal renaissance and specifically being the the archetypal member of court you know i think people use renaissance man and enlightened man but it's not enlightened it's it's closed and it's they, these these people think they're better than everyone else. They're trying to make everyone think that they're better than they are. I think it's some of it. We always think of, oh, he's a renaissance man as a good thing. I feel like it's, oh, he's deceptive then. Well, we are conflating renaissance man and polymath, I think. And I think that the idea of polymath, someone who knows a lot, um, springs from this era it's about being like the ideal renaissance man, but within this specific context, it's also about being the ideal member of court, which also means, hey, be good at telling jokes. 
Because girls might like it. That actually, they're like, hey, women, women like jokes. So be good at telling jokes. I will say, if you want to learn about being a polymath, you can read the book by Peter Burke, The Polymath, The Cultural History from Leonardo da Vinci to Susan Sontag. Peter Burke offered, I got a lot of my information from him, my context information from him about this episode. Look, AC Grayling said it was significant and timely. So, you know, it's got to be good. Oh, hey, also, Matthew, make sure you don't work too hard to beat people in chess. Don't. Yeah, I got that one locked down. <laughs> okay, here's some specific things for women. Finally. You tell me how, how I live up to this. Women blush when hearing sexually explicit talk. I will say your nose goes red when you cry. That's not the same. Is that not the same? Okay, also, don't listen to rumors about other women. Paula, people who gossip to you gossip about you. Mm-hmm. And that's a great line to live by. Yes. I, I know this isn't about me, but I really try not to engage in gossip. This is to both of these first things. Some, a lot of these things are about women needing to maintain their virtue. Because it's much more fragile than men's, especially at this time. And they can, Castiglione specifically was like, hey, you got to be careful because a man can get away with a lot of things. But if a woman is even suspected of not being virtuous, her whole life is messed up. So you need to look like sexy things offend you. Well, a woman's going to lose all her virtue if she opens her legs once. But for a man, it's like, cool. All right. Whatever. Amen, brother. Oh, you should let men know that their lewd marks offend you. So you need to call it out or else people might think you might like it. Oh, that's interesting because I would thought that they would go, you know, go along with it, but not too much. But literally calling people out on it is... Be like, that's offensive, sir. Wink. Be witty, but don't offend. So... You've got half of that down. Uh, don't wear too much makeup. Don't let your clothes, your hair, your makeup or your gesture seem like they took too much effort or be too extravagant. You really need to embody the whole I woke up like this vibe. It's just another way of saying be naturally beautiful. Yeah. Put the work in, but don't let anyone know that it took you work because then you're trying too hard. It is not noble. It is not respectable for people to see that you had to work hard for that to happen. I don't know. How do we think we did? How renaissance do we think we are? I don't think they're going to like the Georgians. I mean, that comes in a couple hundred years. and Everyone's wearing a lot of powder. By their standards, we could never be renaissance men or women. We fail at the first hurdle, which is be of good blood, essentially. (laughs) You have to... In order to be one of us, you have to be one of us. Yeah, you have to be born into it. You know, and they don't... It's not an open society for people to join. You don't get to become a renaissance man. It's more of a way to delineate yourself from the more uncouth upper crust that you don't like. You know what I mean? It's like a locked room inside a bank. You already can't get in the bank, but you certainly can't get into a little locked room (laughs) in the bank. So why did any of this matter? Why was this book and this advice so popular? According to Peter Burke, again, this book was written in response to a time of political crisis and social change when norms which had been taken for granted needed to be adapted and made explicit. It was an attempt to redefine the identity of the Italian nobles at a time when their traditional roles were under threat. That's a quote. Basically, in the Middle Ages, nobles were important because of military power. There were knights. And, you know, things like that. And moving into the Renaissance period, those systems were going away. So the nobles needed a new job. They needed something that made them relevant so that they could hold on to their power and their status. Well, what better way than to be seen as political advisors? To be critical to guiding the monarchies and ensuring that their decisions, their rule was good and beneficial. And that was really the point of all this courtier behavior, to win the trust and respect of your ruler so that you could be a good and constructive advisor to them. So a lot of this is just like convincing everyone that they're important so that they can still be important. It feels like a desperate grasp almost. I mean, it worked, though. People bought into it. So I'll end with this thought. Do we really have polymaths today? True renaissance people who have a breadth of knowledge who know forget the courtier stuff who know about art and science and music and architecture and literature and religion 
Peter Burke had this to say about it. I'm paraphrasing here. Back in the day, you didn't have to specialize your knowledge. But starting in the 17th century, so 200, 100, 200 years after this specific time with Castiglione, the Western world became more connected and we had more flow of knowledge from one culture to another. There was more information everywhere and more discoveries that had already been made. So what we knew about the world was just more complicated and more detailed. To be able to make progress, you had to start to specialize because there was just more to know about everything. Paula, thank you so much for doing the research on this topic. It's not something I would have thought to have done, and I really found it interesting because, again, I'm a Renaissance kind of man. You are a Renaissance man. For look show. at my clothes. Look at this sword. Dark and... You look so much like a Spaniard. I feel like a Spaniard. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, so much for listening to this episode. We appreciate you so much. And the very best way you can repay us... <laughs> <laughs> the very best of, you don't need to repay us for anything you've just been great just listening but if you want to help us out there is a way you can do it and it's this let me quote you something from the book of the courtier true art does not seem to be art so if you think this podcast isn't really art well that's exactly what makes it art duh so there i've always said this this is art because i'm an artist Maybe you don't think we are art exactly, okay? But maybe you like us anyway. Well, how about you leave us a nice review wherever you listen or watch? Like this one from Mr. Brown Esquire. I have been listening to Matthew and Paula's podcast for years, and Remember Remember continues the high levels of quality, interest, and conversation set by Death by Monsters. The genuine friendship between Matthew and Paula shines through and makes every episode feel like you are catching up with old friends. I have even met Matthew a few times, and he is just as genuine in real life, happy to chat, and interested in what you have to say. I can't recommend this podcast enough if you want to find out about people and subjects you never would have thought about looking into. Five stars just isn't enough. That is the kindest review. Thank you so much. And uh, you leave us something nice or funny, and uh, maybe we'll read that out in another episode. Actually, that comment was too nice for me to demean so thank you that was very kind paul is not very genuine in person she's a bit two-faced and she will gossip about you afterwards and i'll definitely gossip about you if you don't subscribe to this youtube channel give the video a like leave us a comment and hey let someone who you think might be interested in what we're doing here let them know about us thank you so much everyone and we'll see you next time bye everyone bye